All right, welcome back to the week three RLAS depth chart show. I am David Syretson here from RLAS Scouting, senior draft analyst, and we have the Duke of Depth Charts, Tucker Moss. Tucker, we are, I feel like you're working in overtime mode with all these injuries around the league and all these you know, PUPs and IR, short term IR, all these practice squad signings and call ups. Are you still alive and do you still have enough juice left in you to, to get through the first quarter of the season? That's a great question. Yeah, I, it's it's uh, it's going well. I kind of like I, I kind of like all the changes because it keeps me employed. But, you know, um, I like true. to kind of see true. what the teams are doing, like what they think is like the biggest issues, even with injuries and kind of how they overcome them or how it kind of can, can end their season, too. So, yeah, it's fun for me to see. Something recent just came through that we don't have on our topic sheet today. And I just want you to kind of, you know, they're playing tonight. So by the time this airs, it might not be too relevant for this week. But this is a relevant situation and story that we will probably even uh, hear more about in a few hours when the Jets take on the Patriots at MetLife Stadium in New Jersey. What happened with the Jets today? Yeah, so um, it's I don't I don't know if it's official yet, but Jermaine Johnson uh, tweeted I think that uh, his um, he tore his Achilles, so he's going to be out for the year, and he was kind of their top edge rusher since Hassan Reddick. Still, that whole thing is going on still with him holding out, and we don't really know. There's no in, end in sight with that. Um, so they're kind of down to their next two guys. Um, they don't have Bryce Huff, obviously they lost him, but he hasn't really been doing great on the Eagles. Um, but it's going to be big for uh, Michael Clemens, who like had a really good rookie year, I know, had a lot of sacks, but then kind of had a sophomore slump a little bit. So it's going to be big for him. And then the rookie, obviously, they drafted last year from uh, Iowa State, uh, Will McDonald. Um, it'll be big for him as well. He has to step up here at the, in the starting spot instead of just being a rotational guy. Um, and then obviously, we kind of discussed last week, they have two undrafted guys, Eric Watts and Braden McGregor. Besides that, just Tack McKinley is kind of just a veteran. So that'll be the big thing that I'm interested to see since tonight's game, but this might be airing after that, of course. Yeah. I mean, it's funny that they have the answer to this conundrum in the room in Hassan Reddick, but they just cannot come to an agreement on that contract. I mean, it's one of the more bizarre personnel situations I've ever seen. And this is coming from an offense that they have it together there. Joe Douglas and his staff, they know what they're doing. And the fact that this kind of blew up in their face right now, the solution may still be out there, but, Every week that passes, Hassan Reddick loses more and more money, but the demand for his services on this team, especially with this injury to Jermaine Johnson, increases. And it will be very interesting to see what happens there. Do you have any update before we get going on, on, on the rest of the show with Hassan Reddick, or is it stalemate right now? It's still just, yeah, stalemate. It kind of just reminds, like, the only thing that reminds me of is just, like, the Le'Veon Bell thing, you know, a few years ago with the Steelers. Yeah. I mean, that's otherwise it really doesn't happen very often where guys are actually actively sitting out games and losing all that that money. Mm. Um that's slightly different because he was I mean, you know, it was with his original team and this is this is just really bizarre though. So yeah, yeah no, no update on that yet. All right. Well let's let's get into our topics of, of the day. And uh this will start off the week three R Labs depth chart show with Tucker and Dave and three, two, one go we are going to start off with the los angeles rams and the niners we're going to start off with the rams first because if you ask me right now which team has been bit by the injury bug the hardest it is without a doubt the rams in my opinion do you agree tucker even though they do have their quarterback under center still the rest of that roster is depleted yeah certainly and then and then we all, we've also discussed recently like which team you asked me in a, in a recent episode which team has the most rookies that made yeah. the team and it's like by far the rams yep. which is very interesting just because you know it, that they're gonna have to have those guys step up um otherwise you know it's it's they're gonna have to adjust quickly to, to playing playing at the high high level and these are like a lot of not high draft capital guy i mean there's like braden fisk and jared burris are the big ones but besides that there's lots of undrafted guys and late round picks that have to play starting roles yeah, that, that roster with all that orange up there, that looks like what most rosters look like during preseason. You know, yeah. it, it's it's 20 deep of rookies, and most of which won't make the roster. I mean, it's amazing, uh, that color code. Scroll down to the IR because I want to get – I want everyone to see what, what the Rams IR looks like. This is an, a, a legitimate, credible football team down there. The, the amount of talent <laughs> yeah. that is just on the IR is would probably start – all those guys would probably start for over half the teams in the league. 
And there's a, th these bodies are really starting to mount up. And this is not even including Cooper Cup, who is out multiple weeks. Give us a little rundown, and I'll, I'll throw in some thoughts on potential replacements on who these guys, which one of these guys is uh, – heading to IR or has already been IR and, and their status in terms of the next few weeks. For sure. So the, the recent, I mean, the original ones that they kind of had there that they lost was uh, Darius Williams. Um, is it going to, was going to be a starting wide receiver, starting a cornerback for them, excuse me. Um, but he's out for the next four games, at least that's the little, the little carrot at the end of the position. That means that they're eligible to return at some point. If there's yeah. no carrot there, then that means that they're out for the year. Um, definitely. So uh, but Darius Williams was, was the big one, like the first big one kind of to, to go. Um, and then Connor McDermott was going to be filling in for uh, Alaric, uh, Alaric, Alaric Jackson, Jackson yeah. yeah, who was suspended. But um, he got hurt as well. So then they kind of had to just go with Joe Noteboom, who's also on IR now, is a new thing. So, like, they're missing their, their three and number three and number four tackles. Um, and then... Uh, Steve Avila, who was playing, they moved, he was going to be the center, but then they moved him to guard at the last minute and swapped him with Jonah Jackson. But they're both on IR now anyways, so uh, missing both left guard and center, backup left tackle, starting cornerback, uh, Puka Nakua, obviously, so starting with wide receiver. Uh, and they just lost John Johnson as well, um, who's who was starting at, at safety for them next to Cameron Curl. And yeah. then Tyler Higby as well on the, on the pup before the season, so... It's just a lot, and then obviously we did. We already mentioned Cooper Cup as well as the other big one, who's not on IR, but he's going to be out for the next couple of weeks. Yeah. So on these depth charts, if you guys are ever opening up a depth chart and you see that red, that means that they're injured, but they're not on IR. It might mean they're questionable or doubtful, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're out. But it does mean if they're on that roster, one of those top two pages, that they have not been put on IR yet. We know through McVeigh that Cooper Cup is out. And it's going to be interesting to see what they do uh, in this passing game, which is very much in, in win-now mode. And Jordan Whittington is a wide receiver that was chosen in the sixth round. And this is his profile right here. I had a sixth or seventh round grade on him. I run most of the offensive grades, uh, pretty much all the receivers. And I had a sixth or seventh round grade on him. And he went towards the end of round six, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Um this is a guy that actually almost walked away from the game early in his career at Texas because of just reoccurring injuries that were dating all the way back to high school. Uh, but he did finish his career at Texas playing in 29 consecutive games. This dude was a menace after the catch. They had a lot of talent there. Um, A.B. Mitchell and Xavier Worthy, uh, much more talented receivers. But Whittington was a, very much a factor in that Texas offense. And it was a lot of the the grit, uh, the the competitive nature the physical nature that he played with and that fits in perfectly with what the rams do with their wide receivers i mean these guys act like tight ends they line up as tight ends in some roles because they have to block they have to play physical and he is a an ideal fit it's almost like he could be uh this has already been thrown out there he could be this year's puka nakua for the rams you know a random day three guy that no one really had a high grade on and uh and turns out that he's just an ideal fit and now the, the demand for a, someone to step up is is right in front of them because Stafford is still there, one of the elite quarterbacks in the NFL, in my opinion. But now these targets between Higby, Cup, and Nakua, they're, they're there for the taking. And Whittington's going to get a shot. Um, he, he has gotten a few looks, and his yard after catch is in the NFL is already starting to translate. So this is a guy that I think is worth keeping an eye on this weekend. Yeah, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Did, did Puka kind of fall – slightly because like in the draft because of injury related things like i know he got hurt a lot in college as well yeah multiple injuries didn't ha didn't blow his the doors off as a um in his pre-draft workout i think he's a slightly older prospect as well um his his game was always clean and nfl ready the routes the ball skills the the physicality behind his game but there were injury concerns and just overall speed concerns gotcha yeah so on, on just a very surface level it did remind me a lot kind of 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 puka yeah. in terms of the injuries and like kind of where they went in the draft. And then they both were just highly praised in training camp throughout, yeah. like Sean McVay saying he's going to be a factor in the offense. And that's, well, it's not really that common for like a, a sixth or seventh round pick. To, to here's like the that. opportunity. Yep. But you know what? I mean, this team, this offense is only going to go as far as the offensive line takes them. I mean, they are very banked up. This team has already had eight offensive linemen play over 25 snaps. And this Crazy. week, 
we're going to get number nine be, with Alaric Johnson uh, Jackson coming back at left tackle after his two game suspension. This is a kid that was the left tackle at Iowa <laughs> when Tristan Wirfs was there. They that had that really strong left right combo. Um, and he went undrafted, but he did exceed expectations as injuries mounted um, along that offensive line early in his career. With that said, though, he's still not a good left tackle. I mean, last year he was one of the worst pass protecting percentage wise left tackles in the NFL. So I wouldn't expect this to all of a sudden solidify that offensive line. Um, it's just, you know, the, the amount of guys that have seen substantial steps, th this is usually correlated to teams that don't play well throughout the season. There's chemistry up front. They're constantly shuffling guys in and out. And I think that's going to be, to me, that's the bigger concern with the Rams, especially with this Niners opponent standing in the face than the receivers. For sure. And and I think you could see that a lot with the Cardinals game and just how out of hand that got um, with like just losing the battle in the trenches. Yeah. Defensively. And we'll move on to the, uh, to the Niners. That that's injury to Johnson at safety. That's going to be a big deal. This is a team that already traded away their middle linebacker this year in in, Ern in the Ernest Jones, and now they're now you're talking about they lost Aaron Donald this offseason as well. Now you're talking about the spine of the defense, the middle of the defense at all three levels. They're missing something, and Cameron Kitchens is a guy that is probably going to get a look, whether it's as a starter or in a, a significant amount of packages. Uh, this was an All American back in 2022. Uh, we had him. He was a fourth rounder. John Cooper, our defensive guy, he's really good at watching the defensive backs and projecting them to the next level. He actually had a first or second round on this kid. Uh, he get, he did end up going 100th overall. Mm -hmm. And the reason why, let's I want I want to show something in the scouting report. If you guys can see, uh, I was looking at this earlier. Um, bah, bah, bah. All right, so you see the 2023 stats. You see the tackles, the tackles for loss the sacks, the press makeup, uh, press makeups and, and five interceptions, the OSR 20 out of 20. Our lads has an athletic grade that we have an algorithm that will come up and spit out who is truly the best athlete at the position. And we use different numbers and different metrics for different positions and not everyone works out. So it's not a, it's not a full scale comparison, but he was in last place out of 20 safeties that went through our OSR process. And that is why he fell into day three. And that's where I think uh, the Rams are going to be a, a little afraid to put him out there as their last line of defense. He was a playmaker in college, an all American, but he, there are speed concerns and he's a bit of a gambler and a guy that doesn't have the speed to make up for a, a wrong guess, if you will. Yeah. And like even even in the last game when uh, John Johnson got hurt, I think he only played like 30% of snaps, John Johnson, I mean. Yeah. And then Kitchen, Kitchen, I think he only played like 16% or so snaps in that game. So I'm not sure how much he'll actually will play. Like sometimes it, it, sometimes it can be easy to just be like, well, clearly it's going to be the next guy behind him, you know. But a lot of times it's not that simple. It's going to be a lot of shuffling around. So I might expect Quentin Lake to maybe go back to safety a little bit more. He, he sort of transitioned to be like only a nickel this, this off season, but he was kind of the main guy who played a lot of safety snaps in that game after John Johnson went down. So it could be more like they, they have someone else kind of sub in and play, play nickel. Like Kobe Durant might, might, might move. They might put mm -hmm. some other cornerback might promote someone from, some from practice squad. So he'll definitely get a look, uh, an opportunity, but I don't know how much he'll end up actually playing. Yeah, they, they, I mean, a, a team that has not valued a lot of high draft picks for a long time, a team that is paying a ton of money to the offensive side of the ball. This is what you have to do to build the defense is find talent in the undrafted free agency period and try to get strengths out of people where other teams might even not even consider you a player. Um, so it, it will be interesting to see how they combat uh, the San Francisco 49ers. And that's where we can kind of transition to. Uh, that Niners roster, this division matchup between Sean McVay and, and Shanahan, guys that used to coach with each other, they know each other as well as anyone. It's always an entertaining game. When the when when this was flipped, when the Rams were the class of the NFC West and the Niners were, you know, playing with second and third string quarterbacks, Shanahan just had McVay's number. And I could see this game going in that direction at some point. The Niners are obviously a better team, but these guys know each other so well that coaching is truly going to matter. What happened with the Niners roster this week? What are we looking at here? 
Yeah, so give me just one moment here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the obviously McCaffrey was kind of the big thing, but they've, they've sort of had Jordan Mason replace him to an extent. Obviously, no one else is McCaffrey, but he's been he's been doing a great job for them. Um, but their their big injury was Debo that they lost. So already, like Ayuk has been a little a little rusty to start out at least week one. I didn't watch him too much week two, but I know he didn't he didn't do too much statistically. And they obviously lost that game against the Vikings. Um, but having no Debo is just another kind of huge sort of weapon that is not really replaceable he's very versatile kind of similar to McCaffrey where they're both like you know very Shan- Kyle Shanahan weapon guys like they, they can, he can move all over the place um so I would probably expect like Juwan Juwan Jennings is going to play a lot more snaps um and then I know that Kyle's talked a lot about Chris Conley um and so I bet he, he'll probably play a lot more on the outside but it could just be that they play a lot more you know 12 personnel are just playing with Kyle check a lot more as well. So um, yeah. it, I don't know how much it'll be like if it'd be a fantasy relevant thing or anything like that. Um, but it's, it's huge for their team uh, to not have Debo or, or McCaffrey because defenses don't have to worry about all those types of things. Like Debo is doing running jet sweeps or, or, or running the ball. Um, it completely eliminates a dimension of the game that they normally have. Definitely going to be an interesting way to, th- to approach their offense. And there's two names on there that I think are going to get a look at some point. It's Jacob Cowing from Arizona, the rookie slot receiver, and Ronnie Bell, who made this team be as a special teams and, and what he can do outside of playing receiver. But there's some dog in him as a, as a competitor after the catch. I loved him coming out, um, got his career off to a really hot start at Michigan. Then he had a significant knee injury, bounced back, and played well, okay, in an offense that really – doesn't throw the ball much. So I still think there's a little bit of an unknown, but when you look at those measurables at the top, it's just average to a below average across the board. There's that OSR coming up again, 20 out of 46. That is my grade there. I had a third, fourth round grade on him because he's a guy that I think could be a a really solid number three, number four receiver for a team that values yards after catch and physical grit and toughness. And that's what this offense is. Uh, But I'm going to circle back to Ayuk. This is a guy that essentially missed all the preseason, all of the training camp. And it would be foolish to expect him to come in weeks one and two and be on fire and, and have all that chemistry with Brock Purdy. Uh, but now that it's week three and the demand for his services, his play is going to be higher. I'm going to expect to see what we've seen out of IU when Debo Samuel is off the field since 2021. And it's the best version of IU. The best we see of Ayuk is when Debo's not on the field. He averages 2.92 yards per run. I don't get into a lot of different metrics and statistics. I don't think they always tell the story. But in college scouting and NFL, that is a number that I very much pay attention to. 2.92 uh, yards per route run is an elite number. Uh, for the past four years, if that was sustained over an entire season, he'd be top two or top three in the NFL. You know, up there with C.D. Lamb and Justin Jefferson. That, that's the kind of production Ayuk is putting out in a running offense, by the way, when Debo's not there. So this is the week where uh, I'm going to try to talk this into existence because I do have him on my fantasy teams, and I need this guy to step up and do something. So with McCaffrey out and Debo, it's going to be force feed this kid all day. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's going to be, especially just coming off that loss at uh, Minnesota, um, they're going to be – you know, I feel like they're going to want some uh, some vengeance here, and, and the Rams are going to be a prime target for that sort of <laughs> with all the injuries they've endured. Yeah. Now moving on to the other team that was in the Super Bowl this year, last year, and that's gets Kansas City Chiefs. They are in Atlanta, Week Three. I believe this is the Sunday night game. Correct yep. me if I'm wrong. Uh, so going to be a nice, fun national stage. Uh, still trying to figure out what the Falcons are, but uh, yep. the Chiefs, we kind of know what they are simply because of Mahomes. But there are it's what what I'm actually admiring about Mahomes as time passes beyond his physical talent and the circus act that sometimes we see him uh, with do with the football in his hands is the pieces around him continue to move around. It's a different running back, it's a different receiver all the time. These guys are getting hurt, uh, getting signed and not panning out. The team is still elite because of him. What is going on now with this Chiefs offense? Yeah, so the big thing, I mean, we kind of saw last year they sort of shifted a little bit where they were their their really strong part of their team was their defense, and they kind of were running the ball a lot more um, with with Pacheco. Uh, but obviously, Pacheco had that huge injury uh, just recently; he fractured his fibula, so he could be like 
he's definitely going to be at least six weeks. Um, Andy Reid alluded to it could be the rest of the year. We really don't don't know at this point. Um, I, I know he just had surgery yesterday, and it, things went you know things went normal. So, uh, but we we don't really know as of now. But the big thing is like how do they replace him because he's kind of been their their guy um, since Edwards Delaire hasn't really panned out, and he's been I know he's been uh, he's been on on the pup I think or non football injury list. Um, so right now they actually the, the big the big talk of the town right now is Carson Steele mm. out of UCLA. Do you got anything on on, on this guy? This uh, I know he owns a uh, pet alligator. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely a farm boy and probably fits in well with with a lot of the the demographic out in Kansas City. Uh, but this is a guy that when I remember scouting him at UCLA, it reminded me this happens every year. This is a guy that just dominates high school football, that kind of profile and. He college, he does well enough, but it doesn't pan out in the NFL. But he had a really impressive preseason. He did look like the second or third best running back on that team through preseason. You have to take that with a grain of salt. But I'm actually kind of going the other way on him compared to most people. I don't think this is the number two back. I don't know if this is the guy. Let's bring up fantasy. A lot of people want to know who's the Chiefs running back going to be. I'm looking at Samaj P. Ryan, a guy that they signed late in free agency uh, um, when do we have him being signed, Tucker? Scroll down. This guy's been all over the place. So, yeah, it was in August. It was after training camp. That's why I thought it started after training camp. This is a guy that gives dependability. And you see this with a lot of coaches, veteran coaches in the NFL. If their starting running back goes down, they want dependability. And they don't want a back that fumbles. Who fumbled last week? Carson Steele. They don't want a guy that can't pass protect. And, you know, I think Steele's only had two uh, pass block snaps as a running back in the NFL so far. P. Ryan has a guy that has really morphed his career. He came out of Oklahoma years ago in 2017, I believe, as a power in between the uh, backles to, uh, between the tackles uh, back to, I believe it was Cincinnati, it, if I remember correctly, or, yeah. I didn't, or Washington, Washington first. Washington, yeah. Washington. Yeah, he was on Cincinnati prior to this. Now, he the, the, the issue, though, and this is where I'm kind of uh, – lost in terms of what's going to happen. He has not had over eight carries in the game since the middle of 2022, but he has turned himself into a pass catching back. Get this. Okay. Over his first four seasons combined, he had 36 catches in 2023. He had 50 catches alone, 16th in the NFL among running backs in 2022. He had 43 catches, which was 13th in the NFL among backs. So to me, that's where I think this passing game is going to turn into. This passing game is with Mahomes, it's all about getting it out quick. The the average depth of target was one of the lowest in the NFL last year. Tons of screen passes, tough, a, a bunch of dump offs because the NFL is is playing a lot of cover two and they're not letting him really go through progressions and throw those backside digs and throw the ball downfield. I don't even know if they have a downfield threat. So I actually think Pirine is going to be a key contributor in the passing game uh, with, with the if history repeats itself. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. Um, it makes, usually they kind of like to opt for a, a veteran type guy and, and them grabbing P Ryan uh, after he got cut by the Broncos totally made sense. Um, only reason I have steel first, I mean, I could, it easily might end up flipping uh, in the game, but just going based off last game, sort of what happened, P Ryan snaps didn't really increase. Uh, very much and he's sort of just been a third down guy for them so far though he's still kind of learning you know the offense and everything um and steel it seems like they're gonna try to have him be like andy reed's talking him up they're they're trying to gonna have him try to be that early down you know thumper guy um i don't know that doesn't mean he's gonna get 30 carries you know i don't think he'll fill in exactly for pacheco but um he's definitely gonna have an opportunity here i don't know how much fantasy value that would provide but i feel like he he could be interesting like Kind of similar to James Robinson, like uh, with the Jaguars, like kind of mm-hmm. a slower like back who ended up, you know, going undrafted. Yep. Um, I could see him doing well just because of the circumstances. But like you said, P. Ryan is, is the, the vet here. And uh, they also, I should know, they also, they promoted uh, Keontae Ingram from their practice squad. Okay. That they had last year. Yeah. And then they also uh, got Kareem Hunt back as well on their practice squad. So they could end up elevating him. I'm not sure yet what, what they'll do there, but um, they, they have a few options. Clyde Edwards Hilaire is due back week five. Yeah, it, it it at the earliest is week five, so we don't right, really know. Right. I think That's it's I think it's, it's like a I think it's like a PTSD thing he has going on, so I'm not too sure on Got the it. timeline of it, but earliest possible is week five, yes. Okay. And 
that's not the, the last issue that this offense has at the skill positions. Hollywood Brown hasn't played a snap for this team yet. I got another guy that I drafted in fantasy football, and it looks like he's going to miss the entire year. What's going on there? Yeah, so he's he's likely out for the year. Um, I mean, technically he can return, but all, all indications are that he's going to be he's going to be out. Um, the big with with a shoulder injury that kind of happened before the season. Um, which didn't it didn't seem as bad, but then he ended up having surgery on it, and it was confirmed that like yeah, they're just gonna go for the long term health for him. Um, so that that's, I mean, on the one hand, they were able to win the Super Bowl last year uh, without you know that many weapons, but that was clearly like the glaring uh, weakness of their team was the lack of receiving talent. So uh, I think having Rasheed Rice have one more year under his belt now, he kind of he really came on towards the end there and in, in the postseason especially. And then drafting Xavier Worthy, so they'll certainly be in a much better spot. Um, I will note that they they play like a really high rate. This is pretty common throughout throughout their uh, history in the Mahomes era. Is that they play a lot of twelve and thirteen personnel, meaning yeah. like Extra multiple tight, tight end ends. sets. Um, so Kelsey and Noah Gray are, are playing a lot, you know, at the same time on the field. And then they drafted Jared Wiley, who's who's seen as kind of maybe the successor to Kelsey when he retires, or who knows, but. He's been playing like uh, 20% of snaps or so, uh, so far. Noah Gray has been playing around 50% and then Kelsey's still playing most of the game. So it, it, Justin Watson will, Justin Watson and Juju might rotate in to be like that when they go into 11 personnel, but otherwise I'd expect just, you know, more tight end usage. You look at a lot of these names, Justin Watson, Juju Smith-Schuster, Sky Moore, Nicole Harmon, all of these guys have had success in the NFL and, or in some of those cases with Mahomes. And yeah. I, it it even makes them even harder to game plan now that now Marquise Brown, a guy that has not really been a durable player, I think, for three years now. And that was the report on him coming out of Oklahoma, a very mm -hmm. undersized receiver. And that's the fear that I actually have with Xavier Worthy. He has that really diminutive frame and he's an aggressive physical player. And, and a lot of times those guys just won't hang on. I mean, it's funny when I was scouting Brown, uh, Worthy, the name Marquise Brown came up on several different occasions when I was just trying to find my pro comps and yeah. So, I mean, he, here's the issue is in, in terms of defending them, they can do whatever they want with any personnel package they want. And it, and, and whoever's on the field, it's never a tell. So if they do go into 13 personnel with uh, Kelsey and gray and Wiley on the field, they, they can still run their full pat pass rush. Uh, sorry, their their pass tree repertoire. They they can throw anything at any point with those guys on the field. Where most teams, you bring three tight ends on the field, and that's a tell that they're going to be running the ball. Now yep. you have Maje Piron, we just talked about another pass catcher. This is just going to be another Andy Reid Masters course on. Hey, I don't care who's on the field. I got my quarterback. I have my scheme. I have my superstar, Travis Kelsey, and most importantly. I have my offensive line intact. You know, we're going to be fine. So that's going to be a game that when I watch that Sunday night, I'll have this that chart open and I'm just going to really kind of monitor these different personnel packages and see how well and how off balance he keeps that Atlanta defense. Absolutely. I just hope it's a competitive game. I'm going to be at the, at that game. This Are you going to go? Well, yeah, good for I'm you. Pretty, pretty excited. That's awesome, man. Good for Hopefully you. Hopefully we don't get stomped. So. No, I don't think it'll be stomped. Um, I, I, especially the, the issue is you are come, playing with a short week and you're coming off a, an emotional win. So that could, you know, that, that it could go either uh, way. That could go either way there. But I, I don't think it'll be a blowout. I don't think the Falcons are a team that are, it's going to be, it'd be very hard to blow that team out. I just think they have a good system, good coaching system. Um, and it's early in the year. They're still hungry. So I, I yeah. think that's going to be a fun game to watch. Uh, let's move on to the uh, Denver Broncos, uh, a team that so far looks like they're going to be contending for one of the worst three or four records in football. Uh, what's going on up there? Who are they hoping to get back and, and who actually is going to be not on the field this upcoming week? Yes, yeah, so obviously, I, I think their defense has played pretty well, but it's more just offensively. They've been one of the worst um, so far. Like Bo Nix has, has been very, you know, has not been great so far. So I, a lot of the rookies sort of, uh, I think Jane Daniels has probably showed the most, but still everyone, everyone's pretty, pretty, um, for how hyped the, the quarterbacks were, that's still really early and people expect like CJ Stroud, but 
right. you know, Stroud didn't, it wasn't like immediately like he was a star or something. It took a little bit, you know, longer through the season for him yeah. to sort of that's, hit his groove. Yeah. And same with Jordan Love. It was like, it's really easy to have that kind of recency bias of that second half of the year where they both were like, oh, these guys look like the best quarterbacks. Um, but that being said, yeah, they have had injuries here on their defense. So um, uh, John Franklin Myers and Baron Browning both got hurt. Um, I think Browning's been kind of their top top edge rusher. Yep. And uh, I don't I don't know about his, uh, his like how likely he is to play, but it's notable that he left the game and John Franklin Myers both left the game. Um, and then the other thing was that Mike McGlinchey's placed on IR now. He has not been he has not lived up to his contract. Uh, that he was signed to from 49ers. He he was their right tackle here. He I got him placed down here now. But uh, yep. he was placed on IR, um, and it'll probably be either Matt Pert or Alex Palzuski, uh who will replace him. But yeah, it, it's it's not looking great. Uh, just in just in every if you look all across the roster, I mean the receiver core is pretty pretty weak. Hmm. Um, the O line is weak. The run game has been horrific and then Bo Nix obviously is is very raw it's kind of so yeah but what do you have to what do you think about this team yeah I mean just in terms I mean this team was if they were going to be competitive if that was going to be a thing they were going to be very reliant on the defensive side of the ball uh that was confirmed when they traded away Jerry Judy and it, they just don't think that he offered enough they'd rather get some draft capital back for him so this is also a defense, one further, that was going to be very dependent on the pass rush. And to, to lose Browning or potentially lose Browning and John Franklin Nyers not being at full strength, now you're just looking at a, a defense that is pretty easy to beat. And that that's where, you know, they're playing against Tampa Bay, who I'm still not completely convinced on offensively, uh, but we'll see what happens there. But this is the name I want you to keep an eye on. This is where... You know, my, my my previous scouting from last spring kind of perks up. Jonah Ellis, the third round pick, Coop graded him, graded him as, as a day two pick. That's exactly where he went. He recorded his first sack last week against Dan Moore, Steelers left tackle, taking down uh, Justin Fields. This is a kid that has a lethal spin move as a pass rusher. It's not a it's not a move that a lot of guys can really use effectively, but he is so efficient with his timing and how quick he can uh, move left to right once he sees a tackle committing over committing to the to the outside. This is a guy that if Browning is out, he's going to get a lot of looks as their edge defender, as their uh, pass rusher, and that will be uh, could be a coming out party for him. They're going to need it. Uh, offensively, I'm a little bit more concerned with what's going on at right tackle. Um, I've been watching Matt Pert the former backup tackle to the giants for mm -hmm. years. And I can credibly tell you um, before and after tearing his ACL, he is one of the low, worst pass protecting tackles in football. With that said, he's had a great preseason. He played, he, he allowed just one pressure in three games, but I'll tell you what, I don't know if he's going to be the start at right tackle. He's been playing left tackle there. Mm -hmm. And I bet the plan for him is to be in this situation, a swing tackle. Hey, you can play both. You've had experience at both spots, but he's been their blocking tight end in jumbo packages. And they might want to keep him there and throw uh, Palsuski in there. Who's been playing right tackle and right guard throughout preseason yeah. after being undrafted free agent in 2023. He was the one that played right tackle when McGlinchey went out last week. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see what they do. I was also thinking they could sign, you know, a veteran, like, like, uh, I think Billy Turner's out there. They okay. could get somebody like that. Um, but it's getting pretty, you know, close to the wire here. So, um, I, I, I would, I would say that it's, it's kind of a toss up right now, but I, I would defer with your, to your knowledge on, on, uh, Matt Pert. Uh, so, yeah, um, I mean, I mean, you know what I, as a giants guy that follows them and, and covers them a little bit, they have had a few offensive linemen leave town and perform better than what they did here in recent memory, Kevin Zeitler, uh, Will Hernandez guys. They're not all pros by any means, but they played better when they left this team than where they were here. Even when Eric flowers, who's a first round bust, he went and played guard for Washington, Miami. Mm -hmm. He wasn't good, but he was better than what yeah. he showed in New York. So maybe Matt Pert, I mean, I can tell you right now, Giants fans are going to lose their mind. If this guy plays good football <laughs> in Denver, <laughs> 
Uh, but hey, opportunity of a lifetime for a guy that a lot of us lights coming out of UConn a few years ago because he was blessed with tools. He was a good athlete. He was long. He was strong. He was still very new to the game. If I remember correctly, he didn't start playing football until his junior year of high school. So there's just a little bit extra development needed him. And the Giants, honestly, they don't have a very good reputation for developing players, especially up front. So maybe they are the problem. And that that case gets strengthened if Perk goes out and has a good game on Sunday. For sure. It'll be interesting to see if, if he's able to. Yeah, I didn't realize he was he was only with the Giants so far. So, yeah, yeah it's not like he's a – I thought that he was older than, than this just because of how many years it's been uh, on the Giants. But, yeah. yeah. Speaking of NFC East and trench play, we have this is going to be the last thing last thing we're talking about today, guys, and then we'll send you off. The Dallas Cowboys, they are they just got the they just got their butts whooped home against the Saints, a team that has really caught the league by surprise. They're up against Baltimore, who has their their backs up against the wall. Zero and two coming off an upset loss, a come from behind victory by the Las Vegas Raiders. They just placed Jordan Phillips on IR. What are you looking at? What are you seeing when you look at what's going on inside this defensive line room and even just roster overall? Yeah. Uh, so I'll say first with their their D line, uh, the big thing was like they lost Sam Williams before the season. He's out for the year. He was going to be, I think he was going to be a starter for them, um, or I guess um, the main rotational guy behind behind Marcus Lawrence and Mike Parsons. But um, besides that. Uh, them them losing him kind of caused them to sort of uh, adjust things up front here with uh, Chauncey Galston kind of was playing. He's always been listed as a defensive end for them, but he has always kind of played more on the interior. Um, but this year now he's, he's playing primarily up at the end because they just needed more bodies there. Uh, they did draft Marshawn Neeland in the second round, so he's been helping out. Um, but they really needed more bodies here in the interior because of moving Golston over. So um, they, they signed uh, Linball Joseph, just veteran from, from from Buffalo last year. And then they traded for Jordan Phillips, who just went down on IR. Um, so they just signed Carlos Watkins from Washington. So they kind of have, you can see their names are capitalized, meaning they're they're 30 plus. So these are just kind of veterans they have there to, to rotate in. Um, but what do you have on, what, what do you what do you think about their, their D-line and as well as Marshawn Neeland? How do you feel about him? They're a mess. That's what the defensive line is. It's a, a complete mess. It's been a mess for a couple of years. They lost a couple of starters to Washington, uh, Dorrance Armstrong and Dexter Fowler, uh, Dante Fowler. Mm -hmm. They left for Washington to follow previous defensive coordinator Dan Quinn. And I'm not going to say those guys are huge difference makers, but they did give a little bit more depth to this defensive front. And the name in that group that has simply just not risen to the occasion after being drafted in the first round is Mazai Smith from Michigan, a guy that a lot of people liked simply because he was a good athlete. But I remember writing a report on him. He was a very unsuccessful pass rusher at Michigan. And this team alone, by the they, they've been back and forth with like, hey, let's just get this guy to lose weight and be a three tech. Let's put some bulk on this guy and have him be a nose tackle. And he really has struggled i mean Tuck, uh, tucker just highlighted one of one of coop's notes about that needs to improve as a pressure pass rusher to become a reliable option or passing downs um as he displays a limited arsenal to win that that is why guys i want to pump up john cooper right here that's why when we say things about these players you got to listen because i think that this is this was a little bit of a reach even though he really did, we, we had a day two grade on him and Dallas reached for him and, and picked him mm -hmm. in the first round. Now they're trying to sign Carlos Watkins, a guy who was on this team back in 2021 and 2022 when the, re when the, when the run defense was a little bit better than it is now, but they're really reaching. If you go, if you get into PFF grades at all, when you highlight their, their defensive line, they're all in the red, the entire group. And this is a team that I think is going to be, you know, tasting blood on Sunday, the Ravens being 0-2. And, and Micah Parsons, he he talked about his teammates in the press conference this week. He says, these guys got to want it more. We need to be, you know, just be a little bit more physical and want it more. And th this is going to be, to me, this is probably one of the most interesting games to watch this weekend. For sure. And, and besides the D-line, I was going to just mention a couple other things. Um, they have a lot of rookies that are starting. Uh, yeah. So obviously Neyland's, Neyland's kind of playing a big role here uh, for them on the edge. And then uh, the, the two big offensive line changes, uh, getting rid of Tyron Smith and then getting Tyler Guyton in the first round at left tackle. And then um, 
uh, Yadish uh, signed with Washington as well, their center, and uh, they got Co- Cooper Beebe uh, in the third round to play center for them. And they, uh, at first, I thought Hoffman was going to start for them, but but Beebe kind of won the job there. Um, and besides that, as well, they uh, lost Deron Bland in the secondary, who obviously was one of the best corners last year. And uh, so they're going to they've been starting Kalen Carson, uh, fifth round corner on the outside that I know that they liked a lot during uh, during training camp. Yeah. Um, and then also uh, last week, especially uh, Mar- Maris Luafau. I don't know how to say that, but yep. he played a good number of snaps last week. I think the second most uh, behind uh, Eric Kendricks. Uh, Demoni Clark started, but he played a significant number of snaps. Yeah, it's worth noting that, you know, they have a new defensive scheme this year. You know, this defense uh, in Mike Zimmer. And I'll tell you what. The only reason this defense has been good is the turnover margin. I mean, what they're doing with turnovers year in, year out uh, under Dan Quinn, not Mike Zimmer, is historic. Uh, so they're, they're doing things that have never been done before. And I've always been taught that if you're a defense that is reliant on those turnovers, at some point that bubble's going to burst. And last week it burst against New Orleans, and we're going to see if they can bounce back. If they can't bounce back and they get blown out or give up a lot of yards and points again, I think the alarm bells need to start going off in Dallas because – other than Parsons and and uh, Trayvon Diggs, you have to start asking yourself how much talent truly is on this team. For sure, yeah. And I, I it's going to be a big test, kind of similar to the Rams 49ers game, where it's like backed up against the wall, and it's going to be alarm bells for both both for all four any four of those teams that lose. So Huge. it's going to be a big week for sure. Yeah. All right, my man. Well, that's going to wrap up the week three R Lads depth chart show. Uh, again, guys, th- this is a must have for fantasy for just, you know, having on your screen while you watch games, uh, because it's inevitable players are going to get hurt. They're going to go down and you want to know who's coming in for them. We had the Jersey number there. Um, we, we, we talk about, we have on there how they were acquired, but again, most of these players, not all, most of these players are going to have an, a scouting report attached to them. So if you don't know much about the backup defensive tackle for the team, your the team's playing against. Um, you can definitely open up that page and just give you know, give you like a little paragraph or two to know what to expect because these scouting reports, I can assure you, coming from someone that's been involved in this for a long time, uh, that simple paragraph right there probably took about 20 hours of work. And it doesn't look like that, because you're just, but it's just a lot of film and a lot of note-taking and a lot of conversations. So I do think it's one of the best resources to have at your disposal while you're watching football on Sundays. So Tucker, anything else for week three? That's all. Just uh I, I just want to say I totally agree like with the the, the, the write up. I mean I'm I'm very novice at, at watching film or, or kind of you know examining how talented a specific player is. But when you when you look at how it's written up and kind of watch for these specific things that are mentioned, you can like immediately be like, oh that's that's why I you can see things and then not really know how to express why right. you think it looks wrong. But yep. this really puts it into a good good terminology for like a, an even new fans to sort of understand better um, what's going on there. That's a great point. Uh, Rex Chapman, former uh, scout with the Jets, um, on a call with him, I remember him saying one thing I really kind of hit home with me. It's one thing to see it, and a lot of us do see the same things, but it's another it's another skill to put words to it. Mm-hmm. And it can really add another layer of understanding. And that's where I think our lads has – your back. You guys don't need to know the terminology and the wording and how to, you know, carefully and efficiently really, because we could write reports 10 times as long, but we know you're not going to read that. So that's like the best quick summary you're ever going to get to really put words and extra context to what you're thinking when you watch these guys. So again, another tool, Tucker, way to crush it again. Uh, let's keep it up. Have a great time in Atlanta and we'll, uh, we'll catch up next week, my man. Sounds good. Thanks Dave. See you guys. See you guys.